Sir Ashley Bloomfield. Welcome to Between Two Beers. Kia ora kōrua. nice to be with you. We're very excited to have you in the Export Beer Garden studio today. There's been a lot of hype from friends and family about you being a guest on the show. The Bloomfield brand is as strong as ever, I feel like. Is it have you got used to people getting really excited to meet you? Does that feel normal now? It does feel normal. I've accepted it. Uh, and uh, you're just, my family and myself, just recognising actually when I walk down the street, I know people are going to recognise me just as I would recognise uh, uh, an all black or you know a prominent politician. And also that some people will want to come up and have a chat and often a selfie as well. I think my poor wife's uh, taken more photos of me with other women than she's got of <laughs> me with her. But uh, yeah, it's just kind of life now. And uh, it's not surprising in a way. I've sort of come to, to accept it because uh, COVID was, it was just a huge experience. And for day after day, the only thing people had to watch or the thing that they wanted to watch every day was these one o'clock stand-ups to find out you know, what the heck's going on and what do we do next? Yeah. Is it true to form? So you've come up from Wellington this morning through Auckland Airport. Same thing through the domestic terminal, stop for a couple of selfies? Not this morning, no. Ah, no. Oh, Most people brand are, is fading. The, yeah. the brand could be fading. <laughs> I tell you what, it's, it, it depends where I am, but... Um, you know, most people, I think, it's just that recognition. It's quite funny. You get a sort of a, a range of, of responses. Some people recognise you and think they know you from some walk of life, so they say g'day, and then you can see them ticking. And there are <laughs> others that come up and go, I'm sure I recognise you from somewhere. And and then they, they might click. But there are there, there are many who, who you can see them, the, the, you know, the hopping on the plane and that. That was brilliant. You know, that's, that's actually point of there. Yeah. It's <laughs> got to be a weird thing getting sort of hit with the fame sledgehammer at age 54. I mean, you had a very high-profile gig before that, but I can't imagine you were getting stopped in the street. And then with these 1pms and COVID, all of a sudden, your whole life has changed, right? Yeah, and I mean, being Director General of Health is high-profile within the Wellington Beltway. But other than that, you know, no one will ever know who you, who, who, who the Director General of Health was or is. Uh, yeah, so it was a sudden, gosh, you're in the public spotlight and um, and certainly when we started those stand-ups at the end of January 2020 had no idea what it would actually transition no. into <laughs> and you know it became quite a thing it's a really good point like case in point, I've got no idea who it is now yes absolutely exactly. no idea yeah. I couldn't even say a first name or a surname or anything yeah uh, nor for any of the public service chief executives in Wellington very well known around Wellington and of course there's the Wellington kind of gossip and rumor mill and all the chatter that happens there but outside of Wellington, I mean, most people wouldn't even probably recognise, aside from the leaders maybe and some of the really high-profile politicians in most uh, parties, they wouldn't recognise most MPs, mm. I mm. wouldn't imagine, on the street. Yeah. yeah. Do you find you also get, because of the job you held and how you sort of carried the country through such a, a tough time, when people come up to you, is there a layer of emotion involved in the greetings? There is for some, absolutely. Uh, some people get quite emotional, even tearful. Uh, I think partly because it's a, it's a triggering thing, uh, and they they just it's just they find it all a bit overwhelming because it was such a big event, and uh, and and it will be triggering all sorts of things. Um, now, when I've talked about this previously, of course, um, the the cookers on. Twitter, now known as X, go off and say, of course it's triggering for people, you know, you ruined our lives. Actually, that's not the feedback I get for, from people. It's you and your team did an amazing job of looking after us. And the the key, you know, one of the key bits of feedback I get is when it was all so uncertain and frightening and, uh, and huge, you were this calming presence, and I talk about in my public sort of talks, actually, I didn't feel that calm in, underneath it all. But I think that's what's the, what people are responding to. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's why it resonates with everyone I've spoken to, because, and the same way for me. I'm like, so excited to have you on because of the way you just, you just sort of handled us through that situation, which we're going to get to. But before then, I want to meet Ashley, and a few little bits and pieces which will help us understand what you really like. So we're recording this the day after the Rugby World Cup final. I'm not going to talk about the game because it'll be dated by the time this gets out. But how did you watch the final? I'm assuming you watched the final. Oh, I did indeed. Yeah. Are you the kind of guy who is shouting at the ref? 
Are you yelling at the TMO? Are you up off the couch when we score a try? How do you watch it? Well, I should say I've got a nephew who I watched the Ireland game with who is like that, and it's, it's, it's quite uh, – I, I really love that. I watched it at home with my wife and the dog, and I'm proud to say that our three children in different parts of the world were all watching it. One was in a pub in Wales – he said, and all, all the Welsh were uh, cheering for the All Blacks. Uh, one was with a whole lot of Kiwis in London in a pub, and uh, our youngest uh, in Auckland here was at, at uh, Eden Park watching it on the big screen. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I wasn't up shouting at the ref. I mean, I was giving, I was giving the, the ref the odd bit of, you know, well-informed <laughs> evidence-based <laughs> advice, of course, <laughs> <laughs> in a very moderate tone. But I get as, I get as nervous as heck, and my wife noticed because I was sending a – I've got a WhatsApp group with a whole lot of schoolmates, and, you know, the, the banter was going backwards and forwards, and my wife said – I was shaking away as I was trying to text. She said – you're more nervous than you were for the stand-ups. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you've got a WhatsApp group. I was group. just going to jump on that <laughs> as well. Yeah, we're going to go good. in there. Are they sending, like, Rugby World Cup aside in its pants, yeah. is, that, is that thread on fire during the, one, during the heat of COVID announcements? Are they, is it a lot of bands going on there? Well, it was. And I'll give you one uh, little anecdote there because uh, during, I took to having my phone on the podium with me, as the PM did, because... Uh, often I would get a question and I didn't have the information available, but I had my media comms manager down the back of the room. He'd be texting someone back at the ministry and they'd text the information to me. So it could <laughs> pop up and then I could come back to the question and look like I was really well informed. Yeah, you know, I just got that latest information. Well, during the, the long Auckland lockdown, and this is the time when I usually say to, uh, to all you people from Tamaki Makoto out there, sorry, that was a long lockdown. Uh, no, you guys did it tough and the rest of us didn't. Uh, I... When the uh, then Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern was um, uh, was uh, communicating a decision about whether the lockdown was being extended or, or Auckland was going down from level four to three or three to two, I think uh, I had my phone on the uh, on the podium and about ten about like literally two seconds after she said Auckland will be staying in level four, <laughs> this one of one of the guys who's in who I went to school with who's who's a, a real wag. Up came this comp. Well, that went down like a cup of cold sick. <laughs> you know, so, so it was sort of this mixed blessing having the phone there. But, you know, they also, a lot of them are based in Auckland. So I got, a, I got plenty of good, uh, re, uh, plenty of uh, a, a very good readout on just uh, what they were thinking and how they were feeling up here in, in Auckland. Yeah. I love that. I love the yeah. thought of that. As, yeah. Again, we, we have, I have surreal moments when we sit in here and we're talking to someone very prominent and the fact that they do everything that we do. <laughs> Completely. Just that, it, it, but the, the, I guess there's the perceptional facade that for some reason you would be completely different <laughs> to the rest of the world is is an interesting kind of take when you pull the layers back. Yeah, and, absolutely. And you explain, yeah, you, you watch the rugby just like everyone else. You've got the WhatsApp chat just like everybody else. Totally. I'm sitting on the sofa in my you know my sweatshirt with a blanket over because it was cold morning in Wellington. But this is the thing when people come up to me in the street. I think part of it's the sort of almost shock. Oh my goodness! You know you're actually a real person, and um, you're a bit shorter than you look on TV, and uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, and you know you just chat away, and you, you're just you know kind of a regular person, and it's it's sort of almost like a surprise to them. I guess it, it's a surprise, but not a surprise. Yeah. I thought for a second there when you were telling that story, you were going to say, and he sent some nudes through or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> that threw you off, but not that day. No. Yeah. no it's, <laughs> It's, uh, there's an awful lot of banter on there. It's definitely not for public consumption, but here we are. And we actually just celebrated a few weeks ago in Wellington. We had our 40 years on of our class, uh, kind of our last year at school. And, um, you know, we, we, were, we were quite a, a tricky year at school. I dare say we were not the favourite year of the teachers. But we've been incredibly tight and really good at keep at um, staying in touch since school. So you know it, the, the WhatsApp group is a part of that, and there's daily banter and and also you know when people are having stuff when stuff's happening in their lives, you know just that ability to toe tackle each other, support each other, find out what's happening. Mm. Are you the most successful in that uh, in that WhatsApp group? The most? Were you, were, There'd be a questions. few other big hitters in there. Yeah. Were you, were you the most likely to succeed out of high school, and are you the the one that has succeeded the most since high school? Uh, they would probably say, my, my peers would probably say I was most likely to succeed. It depends how you define success. You yeah, know. Some of them are just are running you know, really successful, fantastic businesses and have been for a long time. I'd say they're all successful in their own way. And, um, He's and, smart. And, and he knows, he knows that the group's going to hammer him if he that, says that, anything <laughs> otherwise. That's right. They'll all be listening. Uh, <laughs> but that, you know, that, in, in a way, the success is, is the, the fact we're still... Um, communicating and kind of in touch with each other 40 years down the track. Awesome. Yeah. Funnily enough, 
I was at uh, dinner two nights ago and I met someone that went to uni with you in Auckland. Uh, and we got talking about the podcast and he said, oh, you should get Sir Ashley on. And I said, well, actually, we have Ashley on, on Monday. And so Dr. John Bonning, uh, oh, yes. I, I, I sort of said, well, give me the dirt. There's got to be dirt. What was he like at university? And to my dismay, he's like, look, he just is genuinely how he is. <laughs> like, there's no dirt there. He is what you see. Is He's just the, the most wholesome guy, which is great. But when we get guests like you who have reached the top of their field and they seem so stable and in control and sort of well-tempered i love asking them about how they were raised and their upbringing and their parents about laying the foundation uh, and i was wondering if you could talk to us about yeah how ashley was created yeah Jeez, that's an interesting how he was created is a very, <laughs> yeah, that's that's right, very, that's a very <laughs> interesting line of questioning yeah i can refer you a couple of good books on that if you really need them um <laughs> Look, uh, yeah, I'm happy to make some comments there. I, I spent the first six years of my life in Napier uh, in a, a suburb called Marainui, which is a you know, pretty impoverished part of, of Napier and um, a lot of state housing there, um, high Māori population. Although as a kid, you know, that's not what you noticed. It was just kind of where you grew up. And my mother, who is a primary, was a primary school teacher, both my parents have passed now, my mother in 2008, my dad about five years ago, my mother was a primary school teacher and um, she, she had trained in Wellington, which is kind of what eventually brought us back to Wellington. Uh, my father was a mechanic. Uh, he had left school after, uh, well, it was fifth form in those days with school certificate, now year 11. Uh, he, was, he boarded at Danny Boys High School and then he, got a, he was an apprentice mechanic who had, you know, just, and I reflected on this at his funeral, had, clearly was intelligent, clearly had, uh, uh, am ambition in, the, in, a, in a good sense, you know, and, and he could see possibilities, but he worked really hard and, and he ended up his career as being the chief executive of Mitsubishi Motors here in New Zealand. So, you know, I, I guess I could say I came from relatively, um, you know, uh, uh, just pretty, uh, uh, I didn't come from a wealthy background and both my, neither of my parents had gone to university. Uh, we still had all our whānau in, in Hawke's Bay, so we were up there every holiday, so it really feels like my place. And actually, I was just up there a month ago. My uncle and cousin uh, still live in Bayview, just around, just around the road from Eskdale, which got, of course, hammered in the cyclone earlier this year. And my cousin took us for a drive up, uh, up the Eskdale Valley, absolutely devastating. My grandparents are buried there. Fortunately, the, the, the cemetery wasn't um, impacted by the flooding. So yeah, um, grew up in you know uh, in in Napier, shifted to Tawa uh, when I was six years old. So did all my growing up really in Tawa. Loved that as a place to grow up. Um, we went to the local school till I moved on to Scots. But you know it was the sort of place where, and I hope there are still neighbourhoods like this. But after school, we just kind of were on the street. We owned the streets. We were on our bikes. We built trolleys. We'd race those up and down the or, yeah, down the hills, and there'd be a bit of carnage. Uh, there was bush over the road and farmland, so you know I, I think quite a, in a sense I feel really privileged by that upbringing there in Tawa. Um, Were you a competitive kid? Look, I I think I was um, partly because I I feel like I've always been you know I guess it's a little bit driven and, and competitive, but I dare say I must have also um, <coughs> been a little bit bossy because my mother's uh, nickname for me was the boss, you know, and so uh, I, I maybe it was just that kind of. Uh, look, I've got this, guys. Uh, you do this, you do that, yeah. even from a young age. Um, uh, my, my two siblings, I've an older brother, younger sister, were pretty good-natured about all that, so uh, must, uh, you know, put up with me. Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, Napier, Tawa, and then uh, in, in Form 1, my parents made a big decision. My brother was a year old, a, a class ahead of me at school, so they made the decision to send us into Scots to to do our intermediate years, you know, years seven and eight. And then we kind of got, we, we, we got our, uh, we, we liked it there and we kind of fitted in and we loved all the opportunities. So we ended up finishing our schooling there at, uh, at Scots in Wellington. Yeah. Where, did you have this thirst for learning and growing and getting better as a person? Like, do, we, did you and where did that come from? If you yeah, think? absolutely. I think um, it, maybe it's uh, something, I, a, a quality I really admire in people and I wish I was more of this and it's something I aspire to is to be curious. You know, I, I, I really admire curious people and I've got some friends who just are fantastic at just, you know, that questioning, that inquiry and so on. Um, but I did, 
Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, I enjoyed school. I enjoyed learning. Uh, I well, I enjoyed it, all of it. So you know, my time at Scots, there was virtually nothing I didn't do. The only thing I didn't do was debating, but probably because I just couldn't fit it in. But you know, it was every sport that was on offer. I was in the pipe band, you know, doing that essential, very skilled role of being the bass drummer. Um, <laughs> I was, you know, I was in the choir, I was in the orchestra, I was, I played at rugby and, uh, uh, you know, I was in the school plays, you know, so whatever was on offer, I was doing it. And so I guess that was sort of a, um, just an interest in, in trying different experiences and kind of gathering life experiences, yeah. So we went to Auckland Uni. Um, one of the interesting little quirks we picked up on our notes is that you often hitchhiked from Auckland to Wellington during the uni years. Is this something that you did a lot? And do you have any interesting hitchhiking stories? Yeah, plenty. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that you can share? Yeah, yeah. look, I, I, I started hitchhiking at school. Uh, I, I would often have a late either rugby practice or, or uh, play practice at school. And we lived out in Tower, so it was bus and, uh, tra- uh, train and bus off and bus and train to get home. So I'd, I'd go to the Wellington Railway Station, I'd see, oh, the train's in 15 minutes, but I'll just pop out onto Platform 9 and stick my thumb out and, you know, see if I can get a lift, and invariably did. And, uh, and it just started there. So when I got to university, it seemed perfectly natural to hitchhike home on the hol- in the holidays uh, from Auckland down to Wellington. And <coughs> I, I loved it. I loved the fact that you could get from Auckland to Wellington and usually get a, a, a bus out to, uh, well, there wasn't the motor then, but the crossroads just by Pukekohe there, and then um, you'd always get to Wellington. I'd be I'd be home uh, that evening, and sometimes it would be two rides, and sometimes it'd be ten. Uh, I hitchhiked with a mate. Actually, we, we this is a, a slightly further forward story, but we ended up sailing a boat from uh, helping sail a boat from uh, Australia, Rockhampton to uh, Auckland. It was a pretty torrid trip. This is when I was on a year off med school, and then we hitchhiked to Wellington, and we got ten rides that day, and it included like a couple of. Uh, farming women who had the dogs in the boot of the Holden, and then we got we. Uh, I, I I did one stretch of the journey on uh, lying on boxes of grenades in the back of a of an army <laughs> Land Rover, and we were sort of in the in the cab of a truck and so on. It was just great. But the most memorable trip was one from actually Wellington to Auckland, and it was when I was on my way off overseas. Actually, later that year, I took a year off after three years at medical school, and I was heading on the big OE to Europe, and I got a I got a great lift with a guy from Porirua. Uh, through to uh, to Kapiti, uh, or probably Otaki, and he he knew Peter Blake really well, and he told me this was before Blake did all his big trips, and he said I've just had dinner with Peter Blake, and he's going to do this trip around the world, try and break the eighty days, and then he's got this, you know, he's done the deal with Lion to get the the sponsorship Steinlager to do this, you know, compete in the round the world uh, race, and then he's going to do this third thing. So that was quite well. Then I got to um, to Otaki and I got picked up in a Porsche 930S, and this guy took me all the way to uh, to Auckland. Uh, and just to give you the context, he'd driven from Auckland to Wellington in five and a half hours on the way down. Okay. Wow! So it was a fast trip. Yeah. You know, it was a fast trip back. It wasn't quite that fast, but I was kind of like, well. Uh, this is <laughs> this, this is, is something end. you know. This is this will make a good story on a podcast one day. <laughs> but you continued the hitchhiking across Europe, I think, yeah, as well. I, I, I then yeah, I went to Europe, hitchhiked around Europe. Um, I even did uh, once I got married and my wife and I went over. We did some hitchhiking together in uh, Europe and the UK. You see less hitchhikers on the road now, yeah. but I, I invariably pick them up um, and try to get, yeah, yeah. give people a lift. Imagine yeah. being picked up, yeah, by yeah. Sir Ashley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask. You've got three kids. If they told you they were hitchhiking, are you okay with with them doing it? Well, my daughter, if she was by herself, not really. Uh, the two boys, yeah, are pretty good. And and the middle one, he's just um, he, he's the one who's in Wales. Uh, our oldest son, he's in Wales, uh, just uh, finishing off his OE. Really, he's been he's cycled around Europe, around Scotland. He's been walking in Wales. And uh, we were talking to him last this time last week, and uh, he, w- he was walking along in the dark. It was at night there, and we said, oh, where, where are you going? He said, oh, I'm just going to find somewhere to sleep. And I thought I was getting a, you know, finding a camping ground or a, a, a B&B or something. So next morning, oh, where did you sleep last night? Oh, I found this abandoned barn. You know, oh, it's great. You know, and he said, look, I'll send you a photo. It's just been re-roofed, so they must be, you know, doing it up. But So he's been hitchhiking around and, and just cycling and... 
mostly camping wild and had a fantastic time of it. Yeah, yeah those but are the memories. That's eh? a great way to build interpersonal skills, I guess, as well, like getting into a vehicle with a complete stranger and then having to make conversation for hours on end. Totally, yeah. I did have a couple of hair-raising rides. I won't go into the details, but uh, it is really interesting. You just meet interesting people and you uh, you can... Yeah, you can just connect. And, of course, hitchhiking around Europe, the other great thing there was people would say, oh, where are you staying tonight? And I, I ended up staying. And and, 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 and the, some of those people I am still, you know, that I met there, I'm oh. still in touch with. Yeah. yeah, Awesome. So you do your studies. You come out the other side as a doctor. And <laughs> so you're a house surgeon, which I assumed meant you were a surgeon. But Seamus is uh, in a relationship with a doctor and Tells yeah. me that's not the case. Well, I was in Stephen's camp. I was like, why would you give away surgery for public <laughs> health? And she was like, no, 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 that's the name for a junior doctor. Indeed, that's the one. What, 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 did, what were, were there some interesting things or some skills that you learnt from that junior doctor being on the rounds in terms of, again, to take that hitchhiking um, story further, interacting with people and, and their situations? Oh, look, totally. I mean, that's why you do medicine and, and you're constantly interacting with people, with, with patients, their whānau and so on. And these are people who are, you know, they're at uh, generally at a low point in their lives. You know, it's a really challenging time for them and their, their families. And in those days, and uh, Libby and I did our, uh, our first house surgeon year, junior doctor year up in Whangarei and um, at Northern Base Hospital. And as it you know, as a first-year house surgeon, in the evenings, you were the only doctor where there were two of you in the, in the hospital, and overnight there was just one of you. There, everyone else was off-site, the consultants. There were no registrars aside from surgery. They, they could come in to help um, when you needed them, and they would. But by goodness me, you had a lot of responsibility. So you, you learnt fast, and you also, I guess it was, uh, you know, your decision-making and your judgment just had to, you had to be really... Uh, you had to be on to it or you, you wouldn't survive. Uh, one of the most telling um, lessons from that year was the first time I was working with, with a surgeon uh, who was, you know, well, surgeons have got a reputation for being perhaps not having quite the same bedside manner that physicians have, you know, uh, or people who work with old, you know, do palliative care or geriatrics. And uh, we just operated on a patient, and the patient had uh, cancer. And the, the surgeon said to me, he "said you go, you go and tell them." And I said, "Oh, really? I think, uh, sir, this is, you know, I'm a, I'm just the junior house doctor. I think you should do this." So uh, he said, "Okay." He bowled and straight up to the bed, pulled the curtains around. He said, um, "Bad news. You've got cancer. If you've got any questions, ask Ashley." And I thought, <laughs> "Okay, right. I'm going to do these conversations from yeah. here." You know. Jeez, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty <laughs> So there was a lesson, you yeah. Know? yeah. So the move into public health, from this is considered private health, right, for, for listeners who, who perhaps aren't as clued up as I am. <laughs> private health into public health, why, was that something you always thought you would do? Did that sort of turn a lot of heads at the time? Did people try to dissuade you from doing it? Well, the transition was more one from clinical medicine, and I had done all my clinical medicine in, in public hospitals here and in the UK. So it was a transition from not working with individual patients in the clinical setting to public health, which is, the way I describe it is, it's looking after populations of people rather than individuals and their families. Uh, my parents were sort of, <laughs> they were probably the ones who were most kind of, really? You, you've done all this training, is my father, and I can quote him, you've done all this training just to go and be a hospital administrator, yeah. you know, and... Uh, but I decided this is what I wanted to do. And I had a, a really good friend from medical school who would started the training program. He said, I think you'll like this. And, um, and I really did. And, you know, the question every, every time I'd meet people for years and years, I'd say, do you miss clinical medicine? And I'd say, well, I'm glad I did clinical medicine and I loved it, but I don't miss it. I really enjoy the public health side of it. And just to, just to I guess, the kind of the, to close the loop on the, the comment from my father, uh, he... Uh, when the job as chief executive at Hutt Valley District Health Board came up, he rang me and he said, I see this job's up. You should apply for it. You'd be really good. And I think he'd finally worked out, having been a chief executive of himself, you know, where my career had taken me. And uh, I will, I'll always really treasure that because I can contrast these two comments. But I think at that point he finally got it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, was a, it was a good call because I'm going to lead into, there's a lot to talk to, so I'm just going to get into it. Um, I wanted to start the timeline December 1st, 2019, uh, because I've, I've, I was doing a research on the, the actual rollout of COVID, and it was a case of pneumonia 
of an unknown cause surfaced in Wuhan city. This is before, this, this was when it was just murmurings and it was just sort of, we're not really sure what this is. But I was wondering, did you remember exactly where you were the first time you had heard of what turned into COVID and what your reaction was? Yes, well, actually, like most of New Zealand, I was on summer holiday, you know, summer break at that time. We just had the Fakadi White Island event. Um, I've been, one of the things that's kind of kept me sane through the years and kind of, I think, helped keep the family together, I've been, I've been really um, uh, rigorous about taking breaks uh, every, every holidays. And we had our, and our kind of Christmas, New Year uh, period is kind of sacrosanct. And, and then we head to the South Island for a week or two. And I had that already booked out, but we had colleagues obviously back in Wellington who were who were following what was happening, and it wasn't actually till I got back in, from my summer break after Wellington anniversary weekend, and it was kind of the first thing that appeared on my desk, and I had been following what was in the news, but not really any, any direct communication, because we're talking, at that point there was, you know, there were, less, there were maybe a couple of hundred cases in China at that point. But as soon as I got that and t- started talking to my colleagues, I realised, you know, this could be something. And uh, the year before, we'd had the measles outbreak in Auckland, and we'd been too slow out of the blocks, actually, partly to to to, to wrap around and support the Auckland region. And then, of course, the virus, the measles virus, got from Auckland to Samoa, and it was it was tragic. I think eighty three people died there, many of them young children, and there were a lot of reasons behind that. So, you know, my boss. It, the Public Service Commissioner had said to me, Ashley, it, it, the lesson is if you think something's going to be a 7 out of 10, go 10. You can always dial it back. So we went 10, you know, and s- set up our our, uh, our coordination centre straight away and just started absolutely, you know, tapping all our potential sources of information, all the international links and so on. So one thing, you know, one thing I can say is right from when we thought this is going to be something, we absolutely went the full noise. Yeah. I don't think we've introduced Libby yet. Libby is your, your wife. Indeed. Who, uh, you met in medical school. She's a doctor herself. These initial COVID conversations, are you having chats with her like, shit, this is, this is something, Libby? Like, do you remember like the first time you talked to her about how, how serious this thing was which was coming down the barrel? I don't remember the first time I talked to her, but um, she will remember me waking up at three in the morning in a cold sweat night after night, you know, kind of literally uh, having nightmares about COVID and and just totally, it felt overwhelming. It felt, I don't know where this is going to be, you know, what, uh, going to go, am I up for this? Why me? Why didn't I read the fine print on my contract? You know, one in 100 year pandemic. It's sort of, you know it could happen, but you're not, you're just sort of hoping I'll get through my five years and then it won't happen, but it was happening. So, um, yeah, really early on, I think I realised and she realised as well, as did my colleagues. This was this was huge, and uh, the the frightening thing, and I was I was frightened, and I know from listening to and talking with people who are in similar roles overseas, politicians and public servants. You know, it was a, it was the most stressful time of of our career, or certainly for me, because you just did not know where this was going to go. And if you went back a hundred years to the pandemic, the flu pandemic. Yes, in a different time because we didn't have healthcare systems and we didn't necessarily have the public health interventions and there were there was there were other factors at play like soldiers coming back from the war, but oh my goodness, you could imagine something that was going to be absolutely huge. So it was it was frightening. That that sense of gravity as to what may come was that all playing out behind closed doors before it was I guess very public outside of the six o'clock news bulletin about this thing that was happening on the other side of the world? Did you have that level of information that you had access to, I guess, for you to brace yourself and your department to brace themselves before what was coming? Well, we were as reliant on what was coming from international news sources and out of the WHO as everybody. And one of the things I'm really, I'm, I'm proud of is that, you know, we did our first media stand-up, I think it was the 29th of January, 2020, and it was either the same day or even the day before WHO declared it a public health emergency of international concern. Now, there was a bit of an ulterior motive. We were getting too many media inquiries to, for the team to deal with, so we thought we'll do a stand-up, invite everybody, answer all the questions, see, and then we'll do any follow-up questions after that. Uh, but I can absolutely hand on heart say, at those stand-ups, and if you go back and look at the earlier ones, uh, 
we were saying everything we knew, and if we didn't know, we'd say, I don't know. I mean, I've never said I don't know so many times as I did in those early, early stand-ups. But I, or I'd say, I haven't got that information, but we'll get it for you. And it was a real lesson in what builds trust. And I talk about this in my leadership talks now, is people want to know just not just what you know, but what you don't know, and feel assured that when you do get information, you're going to keep updating them. And so... Uh, there wasn't, there wasn't sort of, we weren't getting, um, you know, intel through the Five Eyes network that was telling us something. There was, of course, speculation for, for a while, and it's still ongoing about the source of the virus. And we'll probably never get to the bottom of that. But other than that, there was no um, kind of uh, behind the scenes kind of covert information. There's a real lesson in the power of I don't know, right? Because so many times in just general interactions, a mate will ask you a question. You might have a vague idea about what that is. But rather than saying, I don't actually know, you kind of pop off with some half truth, half something that you've heard from some other source versus just saying, I don't actually know that, but I'll try and find out and come back to you and let you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I I really emphasize this in the talks I'm giving around leadership that actually uh, it's okay not to know. And people don't expect you to know all the answers. And this is where I think we, you know, we need to cut our politicians more slack because there is no political mileage in a politician saying, I don't know. So then, of course, they sort of maybe fudge the answer and then everyone says, ah, you're lying or ah, you're not, you know, that's just, you're just astroturfing or whatever. And, and even beyond that, it's the, I've changed my mind. I mean, you think about masks, our advice on masks. Well, I got roasted for days by the media on that. But it was just actually, we've got new evidence. The advice has changed. Therefore, this is our advice. And the, the hardest one to do is uh, something's gone wrong. Here's what we're going to do about it. And of course, we cut our politicians no slack to do that. You know, it's kind of next question. I got it a few times from Mike Hosking. It is, you know, when are you going to resign? Straight away, someone's head is looked for not. Well, actually, um, yeah, things don't go right all the time. You, we should expect that. Uh, and it's a, it's, it should be okay for our politicians to say, actually, this hasn't gone as it should. But the media goes straight for the failure and, you know, the failure headline. It's yeah, if, if, if and C's, is that what you call it? I call them the, 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 the media's and favorite F-bomb and C-bomb, you know, <laughs> failure and crisis, which they do overuse. And, and you know, I, t- I started to take this perspective around failure. Actually, the f- failure would be if we didn't review and learn and j- adjust. Uh, but it's not a failure if things don't go perfectly. Of course, if there's an egregious mistake, that's different. But that's seldom the case. I don't want to rehash the whole COVID timeline. We actually have a rule whenever COVID gets brought up on the podcast, we try to sort of nip it in the butt. We're like, <laughs> listeners don't want to hear COVID. but It's a bit feel, hard probably interviewing I, me. I feel like this is the one exception <laughs> where we can talk about it. But I want to really hone in on the 1 p.m. presses because like you say, it started and then you didn't know how long it was going to go for, but it dominated not just your life, but it dominated the nation and everyone was tuned in and it can be what I only imagine was the most stressful period of your life. Can you talk to us a little bit about what was going on inside Ashley's brain in the hours before that 1 p.m. presser each day? Yeah, look, it was a big deal. I mean, almost as stressful as watching a Rugby World Cup final. (laughs) Uh, But day in, day out, you know, imagine that. You know, imagine the Island or South Africa game every day. Uh, So, I mean, it became clear to me quite early on, especially once I started doing those stand-ups with either the minister or the prime minister, that this was kind of a key role for me. And I handed over some of my other responsibilities to other great colleagues who carried those, and that allowed me to focus on it. But uh, you know, it was a it was a big thing every day. It took it took hours out of my day um, uh, mentally and and literally preparing for it. Uh, you know, I talk about the ten o'clock in the morning, set my watch by my cortisol level, just going boing. You know, up really high, the classic uh, res- uh, cortisol response, and then. Uh, you know, I couldn't eat beforehand, uh, and I just had a great team. So we'd go through all the information. Our comms team would have been working with the prime ministers or the minister's office about, you know, what are we going to focus on today? And we'd work up our lines. We'd we'd go through them. I'd put my flavour on them. I'd leg it down the road to the Beehive, have an hour with the PM usually, and you know, communication was one of her big strengths. And so she would be going through on the computer. She'd have a pre. Uh, what, what you might sort of sit down here, team would have written something up, but she'd be going through writing it out in her in her voice, as it were, and uh, we'd be testing things and making sure we had, you know, what what's the, what are the latest tweets coming through? What what are the reporters saying they've got 
some information about so we were as well briefed as possible. But then there was this kind of ritual of going out, going down in the lift and walking into the the um, the beehive theatre on the on the ground floor of the of the beehive. And I've described it as like walking into the Colosseum, mm. you know, not as it is now, like a tourist attraction, but like there's either a gladiator or a lion waiting for you. It just felt like that every day. Uh, and that's not, I, I'm not casting any aspersions on the political reporters because I think actually they are fantastic at their job. And in several times when they were under, uh, you know, a lot of criticism for whatever it was the public took exception to, which was usually things like asking the same question four or five times over. Uh, I, I, you know, this is a part of a healthy democracy. These guys are there to hold us who are in power to account and no more important time to do that when you're in a crisis situation and the government is asking people to do extraordinary things. But my goodness me, you know, I'd come out of it at the end and I'd just be drenched in sweat. It would be like, yeah. you know, if, well, I, if, I, if I could, I'd have a lie down. Yeah. yeah. What would you do? Uh, what, what would you actually do? Would you ever, what would you do for the hour well, after well, you've just well, it was, had yeah, a big it, release? It was just the walk up the road. It was a bit of a routine. Walk up the road, get something to, to eat and really just, just sit down and kind of, let my let my mind and body settle, as it were, um, and then I could, you know, do some other work. Uh, but it was the whole thing was was a was a big deal, and and I guess you could say so. It should have been. And I often I remember talking to a colleague about twenty years ago in in health, and she said to me, she said our jobs would be easy if we didn't care, but when you care, of course, you you going through. And what I would try not to do would be re rehearse it in my mind. So I, should, I could have, you know, of course, mm. I'd be thinking. Yep, maybe, and I'd get some feedback and say, okay, how was my answer to that question? Could I have done that a little differently? So I would be reviewing, but not uh, not rehearsing it. And I never watched, I don't, I don't think I watched one second of any of those stand-ups or no. any of the media because no. it's just, it would have been too much. Yeah. There must have been times when you'd done all this prep and research and thought, shit, i got a shit-hot answer for this question, <laughs> and then it never comes. And you're like, oh, there's no one going to ask me about it. <laughs> no, well, the trick is giving the shit-hot answer even if the question doesn't <laughs> yeah. come. You know, that's the thing. Yeah, Actually, the answer I'm proudest of is one with, uh, with Mike Hosking, and this was in August 2020 when we had the, um, the little outbreak up here in Auckland, and we were deciding whether or not to put people who were community cases into managed isolation facilities. And Mike, in his usual kind of shock jock way, said, uh, oh, come on, Ashley, when are you going to just round these people up? And I said, Mike, this is New Zealand. We round up sheep. We don't round up people. And uh, the thing about Mike was it, was it wasn't a great way to start a Thursday morning. But, you know, he's ace at his job. He's fantastic at his job. And it's like a contest, you know. It's, and so, we, it, or theatre, we were both playing our parts and... You know, when we got to the end of it, he made it really clear to me. He didn't think much of uh, my the job I'd done, but he said, but he did say, but you turned up every time. You yeah. know, even though you knew I was going to give you a hard time. Is that those chats with Mike? Mike obviously has the biggest audience in New Zealand, yeah. and we've had a number of guests on who know him very well. And regardless of what you think of his politics, he is very good at what he does. Absolutely. Does he? How does that interaction go before that? Does he have to tell you the, the things he wants to talk about so you're well prepared, or is it just anything and you've got to be across everything? Well, most of the interviews, uh, if, you, if you've got a half-decent comms team, they will have talked with the interviewer and their team and got an idea of what they want to cover. So you can do a certain amount of preparation. Of course, you don't know how he's going to drop the questions. But some people are, people are quite surprised when I say, well, actually, you know, the interaction with Mike would be, you know, I'd, Go on, I'd talk to his kind of uh, producer, very nice fellow called Michael, and he'd put me through. And, you know, the routine would be Mike would say, G'day, mate, how's it going? You know, okay, you ready? And then he'd say, okay, just we'll count it in three, two, one. Uh, I've got uh, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield here again this morning. When are you going to resign, Ashley? (laughs) But then at the end, it would be, okay, thanks, mate. You know, good as ever. And off he'd go. And and then, of course, you couldn't control what he would say afterwards. But it wasn't, it didn't feel like a hostile interaction. You know, it was uh, it was people doing their jobs as well as they could, and that's why for me it was really important to always front up. It's but that was appointment viewing, mm. Hosking yeah. v Bloomfield, and for the reasons you say, because you knew he was going to have a go, you knew he was going to attack you, and I wanted to hear whether it was you or Jacinda or Hipkins or everyone how they defended themselves against the the questioning. And sometimes you're like, that's a ridiculous thing to say; he's gone too far. But you always kept your cool, 
like you were always calm and measured, like you never reacted emotionally. Were there times when you got off the line, the call finished up, you're like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> but that, that's the old trick, isn't it? You know, um, is if you're going to be a jerk, don't do it when other people are around. You know, wait till you're alone and, and you close the door. Uh, no, I, I just I just sort of felt it was a bit of a contest and I absolutely knew the thing people needed most from me was to keep being calm. And that's what people remember is because that was what was reassuring for people. Um, you know, it, it, sometimes it was frustrating. But actually, in many respects, I found other journalists, particularly the RNZ journalists, because they could be they, they would take longer and they would keep coming back at you and back at you. Mike would just throw another shock jock, you know, question at you. He wouldn't necessarily keep digging. But, you know, some of those journalists like the Lisa Rowans and, and so on, the Morning Report journalists, they're, they're, they're pretty tough. Yeah, I'd heard you named, was Lisa Rowan the, the hardest interviewer? Oh, aside from everyone's, you know, like the, the, the uh, kuya of radio journalism, Kim Hill, of course, you know, mm. and Kim, Kim is... Uh, is outstanding at her job but we've got look across the board in New Zealand we've got great journalists uh, in print um, in uh, on radio and on TV and I think um, you know I, I just think we're well served actually we we had detector inspector Scott Beard on the podcast a while back and he spoke around the personal development opportunities that he had in the lead up to taking his role including public speaking and things um, like that and I gather, Kim Hill, you've referenced her as well. I gather she was part of the interview process for you to get the Director General of Health role. Like, an, Was it an hour back and forth or an hour interview with her? Yeah, look, it was quite a process, that interview process, uh, as you would expect it to be. So there were you know, an hour with a couple of psychologists, then an hour being interviewed by uh, Kim Hill on basically the healthcare system in a, in a, a very you know, uh, realistic sort of uh, setting, situation, with the psychologists in the room watching and really? uh, uh, yeah, observing it all. So, yeah, look, that was, um, I think, an important part of it. And, you know, interestingly, I had done some media work before then in, in my roles in the ministry and as a DHB chief executive. So I had uh, not just had the initial training but had a chance to practice the skills. But by goodness me, like it's like, you know, training for a marathon. You just, the more you do it, uh, the, the, the more, um, I guess, not so much confident, but the more, um, yeah, the more skilled, I guess, and and, and you you just uh, it's like a set of muscles. You 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 grow them, and then you 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 are less phased when different situations uh, and different questions are thrown your way. Because in a weird way, r- reviewing and researching your career, it's almost like the pandemic was tailor made for your particular skill set. You had the soft skills and empathy through your time as a junior doctor. You had the public policy knowledge through being in public health. You had international health experience through going up to the the World Health Organization in Switzerland. You had the leadership and CEO skills from heading DHBs. Um, And you had the measles outbreak just before, which was almost like a mini opportunity to test communication of public strategies to people. It's a weird combination of factors that then presented itself with this global pandemic. How boring would your job have been had all of that not happened as the Director General of Health? Well, uh, I, I always say, uh, especially when I'm mentoring younger uh, people coming through, I say, look, don't don't worry about having a five year plan. I've never had one of the, those. Le- you know, never read even uh, maybe a couple of years ahead. But I can tell you this: if I had had a five or a ten year, pl- year plan, I would not have had the plan to be the director general of health when there's a global <laughs> pandemic. Let's just get that straight. So saying, you know, when. And, and going back to those early days when I was waking up at three in the morning in the cold sweat, and I don't know, I can't remember exactly what day it was, but one morning there was just a circuit breaker where I got up and I thought, actually, you're in the role, uh, you've done all, the, and you've outlined, you've done all these things. All you've got to do each day is just get up and play a straight bat to whatever comes down the pitch and just keep being yourself, just keep doing the best you can. That's all you can do. Uh, and from that time, the, the the waking up at three in the morning stopped. It didn't make it any less stressful and relentless and intense. But I guess I'm really grateful for all the training and all the experience, life experiences I'd had. And that includes the ones I've talked about. It includes the fact that I actually did. I trained as a as an infantry officer in the territorial force. And the the offer, you know, the territorial force commissioning course, seven weeks in Waiuru, is incredibly tough. We started with 42 and 21 graduated. 
they mentally and physically push you to their limit to the limit. And so I learned a lot about myself in my early twenties about you know just how how far I could be pushed and still remain you know uh, uh, I guess always lead self as the is the is the thing that is everything is built on. And so that was what was really important for me also through the pandemic. You certainly did get pushed. I, I want to bring Libby in. We. Um Part of the process, what we normally do is we reach out to friends and family and we ask for little inside lines on the guest. And we went to a few of yours um, and Libby came back and said, no, actually, I, I want to keep our, um, I think, pers- what was it, private and public public um, business separate, which I've totally respected and thought that's really interesting um, area to talk with you about it if you're open to. Because while this is all going on and the stress and the sleepless nights, you're obviously taking that home with you. You can't separate that. Like, how did that impact your relationship at home with your your family? Yeah, well, my family were amazing, and Libby especially, and kind of supporting me through it. You just, it just was uh, invaluable, and I, and I really couldn't have done it without them. And one of the one of the abiding memories of the pandemic for me is actually having all three kids home during that first lockdown, and I was working pretty hard and it was all uncertain and we're doing the stand-ups every single day but just to be able to come home and sit around the table with them all and just be and the fact that we were all there together was was such a um well it was is kind of essential for me i guess through my career i've had these increasingly responsible jobs and even being direct i mean being a dhb chief executive is not for the faint-hearted it's it's you know it's a big job and being dg of health even if there's not a pandemic likewise so i got pretty good at compartmentalizing things and i'm not the sort of guy that comes home and kind of just can't talk don't want to you know like bring me a beer i'm just going to put my feet up on the sofa and what and you know watch sport uh, i always have tried to come home and be my best self so saying the, the big thing was I was carrying the weight of this thing on, you know, in my head and on my shoulders day in, day out, even when we were on holiday, on the weekends, day and night. And I was trying to be my best self. I was trying to behave, but I just didn't have the headspace for much else. And What was the jigsaw analogy? I love the jigsaw yeah, analogy. Yeah, the jigsaw analogy. And this came to me only when, the, you know, it's the day after I finished where I suddenly realised, oh, my goodness, like I've got my brain back. I can think about all these other things. And, and I realized it was like I'd been carrying this, this thousand piece jigsaw puzzle around in my head that I was trying to put assemble, but I didn't have the box with the picture on the front at the start. And every now and then, you know, a piece would come along and I realized, oh, that one's in the wrong place. But every bit of information, every day, I was trying to, I, I was holding that picture and c- trying to communicate it to everybody. And as more information came along or, or, or we knew more, then the picture became clearer and clearer. But s- suddenly I didn't have to do that. So I think I became a lot easier to live with, you know. And, and the key example here is just to have those conversations where when, when Libby came to me and would say, I've just got a few things I need to kind of check with you. And, some, and, and, and most of the time it would be, I'm oh, sorry, I just, I, I just haven't got the headspace to have that conversation. And her next very reasonable question would be, could you tell me when you would be? <laughs> and I should have said, well, when I finish as DG, but I would it'd just be, I can't even think about that. But now, and, and you know, straight away it was, well, let's sit down, have a cup of tea and talk about it. And so I think the fact that Libby put up with that and, and my kids, it was quite hard for them, especially the one who was still at school. Um, the others were a bit more anonymous in, in the workplace or at university. Uh, it was hard, especially when the criticism was, part, you know, was being piled on and something hadn't gone right. Uh, and it, and they never, ever complained once. They never said anything about it. But I know once I finished up, it was a relief for them. Well, you, you would be well placed to offer a sort of snarky retort. Sorry, guys, I'm just trying to lead the country through a global <laughs> pandemic. If you can just put your, <laughs> your issue to a side for one second. Just a quick, was the Bloomfield household the same as other households around that time of like a, a family quiz at eight o'clock on a Friday night that you had to tune in for? Did you get the COVID experience that the rest of us had around baking different types of bread, maybe not you specifically, but all of those things that that time allowed families to have. Did you, your household, yep. indulge in those as well? They did. I don't know how much bread baking went on, and I can't <laughs> vouch for what happened when I wasn't there, but it was a, it felt like a gift. 
I have to say. And, you know, the jigsaw puzzles, the real ones came out, um, board games. But it was just this, you know, the weather was beautiful. We had that long summer that went into autumn. And I can just remember sitting out on the back steps in the sun, all of us just sitting there for an hour. And all you could hear were the piwaka waka, you know, the fantails and going for those walks down the street and up and 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 short bike rides, of course, within five kilometres of home. Um, but it was just, and I, I can remember thinking, what do we fill our days with usually? Why, why is it we, we, we don't have this time usually? So it was, I, I am pleased to say, you know, our family did have those times and I do remember it with, with great joy. I remember that. Where I had three kids under five during lockdown. Oh, and a bit harder for you. <laughs> no, but there would be days when I wouldn't be working and my wife wouldn't be working and you'd have nothing to do all day. So you, you would go on out on a family walk or you would do things totally differently. Um, and also some good gags. We talk about threads. We had one where I think on our thread I sent some videos of um, my kids playing football and a few other dads sent theirs through. And Shay was living with his mum at the time and he got his mum out <laughs> the back of his yard and she was doing some little drills through the cones. And there was just so much of that. It was good. Sort of community goodwill going on yeah. it was it was a good it was a good time it was a really good time like it, it was a terrible time yeah but it yeah. was also in terms of that reconnection piece was an, was an interesting uh, moment in time it was and i think that you know it's really interesting to go back and there are people all around the world i, I get requests every week for to be interviewed on a P, for someone's phd and the last the latest one is someone who's a who's a student at the university of edinburgh doing a PhD on something, and I said, "Look, sorry, I just, I'm, I've kind of had to confine the number of interviews I do around it." But it, it'd be really interesting to look back at that time. But just what was the combination of things that led to such a high level of trust and unity and collective action that actually meant we we nailed it? And I, I joke about the fact that there was that it was a mix of kindness and looking after each other and a bit of competitiveness. It was like, oh. We're going to go for zero. So you know, we're not going to go for a few. We're going to go for zero. We're going to do this better than everybody else. Uh, but it was a really interesting time, and it's also interesting how quickly we've forgotten it as well. Mm. Yeah. Before we jump into leadership, can I just ask one question? How many times during that period were you left, or did you leave yourself on mute during a meeting, and someone had to Ashley, you're on, you're on mute, Ashley. <laughs> just re redo that point, or did you always manage to get yourself off mute? Oh, definitely not. No, yeah. I was struggling just as much as everybody else. Just yeah. wanted to check. Just yeah. Again, you yeah. think you're the expert in terms of making sure everything is, is flowing. Yeah. yeah. So how long we got? We've got 15 to go. Okay. Um, I want to talk about leadership uh, soon, but before that, I, I'd read that you kept a diary through this period. Um, it's the one thing I didn't do. Oh, you People didn't? People often ask me, okay. what's your main reg Do you have any regrets? And... Uh, I say actually my main regret is I didn't keep oh. a diary. I just couldn't, I just didn't have the bandwidth to do it. Um, but if or when I do go back and decide to kind of write something up, all those stand-ups are on YouTube. I mean, every pretty much everything I, I did publicly can be found. And a lot of the paper, all the decision-making papers from government are all now available so and, and a very high rating on imdb as well for yeah. you i know it's, your, it's the sort of rating hollywood would, would die for i, I think. know it's it's kind of like yeah that's a blockbuster 9.3 one 1800 reviews 9.3 yeah. the 1 p.m stand up it's a lot of viewing time if you go back and watch them all uh leadership i mean you, you've got so much wisdom to impart here i know we're a little bit pressed for time but i was wondering if you could just give us what you've learned from leadership what makes a good leader and perhaps what your strengths and weaknesses are yeah, the the well, let's start with the strengths and weaknesses because to me, and I was talking about this just last week with a group of um, scholarship leaders at Auckland University. You know, leadership is a journey in self awareness, and the better you know yourself, then the better leader you become because you you're better able to lead self, and that's the kind of the the, the base for being able to lead others or lead context. So, the more you understand what your strengths are how and when to deploy them, when not to deploy them, uh, you, the shadow sides of your strengths when you over-deploy them, uh, also the things that you kind of don't like doing, your non-preferences. And for me, I'm not a, I'm a big ideas, I'm a kind of strategy guy. I am not a complete finisher. And I'm also, uh, described myself publicly before, as pathologically optimistic. So I need people around me who are going to say, hang on a minute, you know, what about the risks here? Have you thought about this? Uh, so... 
you, you know, my, my, my strengths are kind of in, in being able to be myself and, and connecting with people and developing relationships and connecting information really quickly and working out what the next step is to do. But uh, I, one thing I've had to learn is hold back. You've got to bring people with you. You know, it's, it's one thing to know where to go. But, and, and this is why I love this definition of leadership that I use now. It's an invitation to collective action. So it's not about, you know, it's not about the individual and it's not about telling people what to do. It's a process of engagement. And if people understand, which, which happened through COVID, this is the mission, people. This is what it's all about. Then they know what to do. You don't need to tell them what to do. They go off and do it. Uh, so I guess I've, I, I've, I've loved the journey of leadership is that being that journey and self-awareness. And, and the second kind of broad comment I would make is through COVID, as we've talked about, the uncertainty, the stress, the, the relentlessness of it, uh, the thing that it really came down to, and this was in the stand-ups, was what are your values? Where, where's the place you want to stand? How do you want to come across? Because you can't, I couldn't control what questions I was going to be asked, what people might think of me, but I could always control how I wanted to behave and that's what people see and and so I talk about these values of kindness integrity courage and humility now the former three would have been on my list for a long time but the humility one was one that you know has really uh, has I've added to my list and it's the one I hammer now uh, and I joke about the fact well, there's nothing like having your performance review live on national television at one o'clock every day to teach you humility uh, because the re reporters have got stuff and they you know they're just wanting to kind of trip you up but we need leaders who lead with humility because they are the ones who know they haven't got all the answers. They understand it's complex. They seek people's ideas. They facilitate s solutions. They, they are prepared to change their mind. And most of all, they front up when things don't go right. And, and you know, the other, the other H-U word, hubris. And we saw examples of hubristic leadership during COVID and it did not go well for those countries. So I'm, I'm big on the humility uh, side of things now and, um, and I think it's just such an important leadership quality. It's a pretty comprehensive answer. Have you done a few talks on leadership uh, across the years, have you? <laughs> I'm only just getting started. How long have we got? <laughs> no, there are a few little sort of fun bits I, I want to finish on. And so after you announced that you were standing down, uh, there was this big wave of outpouring of support and emotion. And I'm wondering how many of these things uh, you were aware of or you're able to comment on. Did you ever hear Hayley Sproul's, Hayley's version of Goodbye My Brother she did on the radio? I did, because you can imagine people sent it to me. And I should say, we are huge fans of Hayley Sproul. Uh, so the fact that she had done this, like I think if there's anything from the COVID time that um, has kind of lifted my my kids' view of me, it is the fact that Hayley Sproul did a song about <laughs> yeah. me. Uh, you know, and I'm just, I, I, I'm thinking about it, but she does the she does or the, the weekly uh, comedy show. Um, uh, have you been paying attention? Have you been paying attention? Like that was absolute, um, you know, uh, family viewing. Whole whanau, whoever was there, we would always watch it. We love Hayley. So, yep, I thought the song was just Goodbye, like gorgeous. Goodbye, my brother. <laughs> Just, let her, my just friend. let her do it. Just, <laughs> just leave her to do it. And, and, and you know, here's the thing about Haley. I mean, she's in a, she is amazing, but of course she can sing beautifully as well. Yeah. You know, why why wouldn't she be able to? <laughs> she's gonna love this episode. Did you get eyes on the calf tattoo yourself? I haven't seen it in real life. I've seen the photos, and uh, the person that the, the, the uh, I sort of joke about this because overseas, this is like people just think. Because I'm uh, my, my colleagues I work with overseas at the WHO, I'm doing some work, and they're like, "We understand that there's there's someone who's got a tattoo of you. Like this is they just do not believe." It. I said, "Yeah, there's there's one woman who's going to regret for the rest of her life." <laughs> yeah. I said, "But it's not my wife." You know. uh, rhythm and vines. When did you catch wind? Did you did you know about the rhythm and vines? The big Ashley. The big screen. Yeah, the big screen. Yeah. yeah. Did you catch wind of that early doors, or did someone send you a video of? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it just kind of went off, didn't it? Uh, I, all, all, I just say to people, look, all I did was stand in front of a green screen for half an hour being told, say this, say, no, say it again, a little bit more feeling, a little bit lighter, lift it at the end, you know, and I just said these five or six phrases over and over, 
And then they got some really clever people together that kind of made it into the mash and Wow, it turned into something, didn't it? <laughs> my poor, one of my boys, uh, one of my, uh, unfortunately was up at Northern Base, and you know you can imagine when it came on the big screen, he's kind of like trying to hide in the crowd. <laughs> Luckily only his mates knew who he was. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Podcasts? I heard, we've heard that you, outside of ours, um, what are other podcasts that you listen to or that you get knowledge from? Oh, look, a lot of them are international ones. Um, I love, uh, there's, a, there's a great one, uh, the rest is politics, uh, British based. It's the top podcast in the UK. So you guys are, you know, we, we don't, they, 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 they don't get us yeah. over there. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is Alistair Campbell, who was Tony Blair's uh, spin doctor, is sort of the, the, the original spin doctor, and a, a former uh, Tory MP, Rory Stewart, uh, do this amazing podcast. They know everybody and they are just so knowledgeable about both British politics and global affairs. Fantastic, and and there's a spin-off from that that is called um, Rest is Politics Leading, and they interview they have interviewed the most amazing people from all walks of life. But you know they've got access to top politicians, current and former, uh, all sorts of people, and um, yeah, that that's compulsory listening for me. I listen to a lot of uh, current events ones as well, especially especially at the moment. I'm I'm really running through them, just trying to get insights into what's happening geopolitically. Because by goodness me. Our uh, our world just got a whole lot more complex. It's a bit on, eh? There's a bit on. Yeah, there's a bit on. Um, just finally, what is your job now? What is the next? What does the future look like? Well, at the moment, I'm loving a role I've got at the University of Auckland. Uh, they've taken me on. They've made me a professor, and I've kind of got. I'm back to having a bit of sort of imposter syndrome, which is a normal thing. I tell people it's normal because I have no idea what I'm supposed to do as a professor. But I'm I'm doing some teaching. I'm doing some work on a strategic kind of initiative there. And the international work I'm loving, which is back with the WHO, and this is this sounds really boring, but this is um, co-chairing the process to uh, update the international health regulations. The way I describe it to people, this is 194 countries, there are over 300 proposed amendments, and we have to agree them. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> uh, so I get to co-chair that process. Uh, so a bit of travel to Geneva. Uh, I love the global health work, and, and, and I'm doing some other things here around New Zealand as well. But... Uh, so I've got a full portfolio, but my stress levels, as I was saying to my children a couple of weeks ago, have gone from about 100 to under 5. Yeah, you seem in a really good place. You seem happy and light. Not that you ever weren't, but it's just been so cool sharing this amount of time uh, with you. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, I almost I was talking to Shay before. It's almost like we, we felt like we should say thank you when we met you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you get that a lot. But anyway, it's been such a, a cool experience just reliving some of the highs and lows and, and what you went through uh, but I'll throw over to Shay. Yeah I think we use the term authenticity on this podcast a lot it's probably a, a really overused word in, in modern vernacular but that's what comes through is just your genuine nature and I love your thoughts on leadership and humility particularly humility for someone who's had the spotlight um, on them for so long and for such an intense period of time your humility shines through in your everyday interactions with people and you've been incredibly generous with your thoughts and your time here with us. There's so much more that we could have gone to and, and found out and I really would relish the opportunity to, to listen and sit in on one of those talks on leadership and, and unpick what you have to say. So um, I don't know, I guess my research moving away from this is to go and find out how I can get more of um, Ashley Bloomfield in my life. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks for that, mate. Uh, look, it's been a real, a real pleasure, and um, I love the opportunity just to kind of uh, share. I, I hope people are interested. I, I, and just to finish, you know, I'm just so proud of what we achieved as a country because pe people come up to me and thank me, and I've I've had to work out how to respond to that. And 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 the most important thing that I've worked out, you know, first of all, is to to acknowledge and and appreciate that, uh, and then I and then I like to emphasise how much of a team effort it was. And that my pride is in what we achieved as a country, and my and that and that gives me great hope for the future of Aotearoa. Because by goodness me, there, there are huge other challenges, and we showed what we can do actually as a country, as a nation, if we all kind of act in each other's interests. And my great hope and aspiration is that we will continue to do that. And and I just feel every day I'm so lucky to to live in this country. And during the really dark and stressful times of COVID, when I was feeling a bit sorry for myself. I'd always remind myself, well, at least you're the Director General of Health in New Zealand and not in the USA. Because uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. I've got politicians here who take their job seriously and uh, we, we've got a lot to be grateful for in this country. Yeah. Good perspective. Yeah. Cheers, Ashley. Kia ora.